Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Tech Gamers World. In this video, I've got something really old and really cool here to show you. This is a circa 1960s Panasonic tape recorder. This is the Panasonic RQ-705 sound monitor and tape recorder system. Now I found this at a local garage sale and I got this for $10. So I'm super excited to check this thing out, take it apart, perform a little maintenance, cleaning, and service on it, and see if it works. So as always, if you could click that like button, subscribe to the channel, and stay tuned. We'll be right back. Let's do this. Okay, everyone, welcome back. So here we have a Panasonic tape recorder. Now, this thing is really cool. This is from the early 1960s, and it is super old. I got this at a garage sale for $10. The lady was getting rid of it, and she just didn't want it. So I bought it from her. Figure I'll take a look at it, see if it works, and potentially resell it. So as you can see here, it is a model RQ-705, 117 volts, 60 hertz, 50 watts, and there's a serial number. It's made by the Mastu Shita Electrical Industrial Company Limited, made in Japan. So basically Panasonic. Uh, you can see a fan down in the bottom here. So this thing must kick out some heat. So as you can see, this thing is in really good condition. Back in the 60s, all the rage was electronics. They were becoming new and popular. Amps were getting better, uh, tape recorders, microphones, all that stuff was becoming hugely popular. They had this idea back then, because electronics were so large, to have the electronic device be inside of the case so you would just have a nice carry case. That's what this style was. That was all the rage at the time. And that continued into the 80s as well. You had those the record players that you could carry with you and stuff like that. Nowadays, everything's done on a phone. Tape recorders don't exist. And the world is entirely different. But we're going to pretend it's the 1960s. So, like I said, I got this from a garage sale here. It's, the case is a little dirty. Nothing crazy. Um, let's pop this off here. So, this is a... Panasonic sound monitor system. So you can see the top of the case here. Just a little dirty from sitting in a garage. i um, going to go ahead and clean this up a little bit here. Wipe it down. Just I use just distilled water to clean the cases with. I don't use any cleaners or anything like that unless I absolutely have to. I don't think I really need to for this one. This case cover is in excellent condition. Just dirty, that's all. Just gonna go ahead and wipe it down here. Wipe out the inside, as you can see here. Inside is the original foam that holds the uh, tape recorder heads in place while transporting it. So you can see this is all original um, stuff here, which is really cool. And, uh, all right, let's go ahead and put this, get this just cleaned off here. And off to the side so that that can dry. All right, so the reason we are here, the Panasonic sound monitor system, this is an RQ705. Based on my research, this was built during the early 1960s, I think sometime around 1963 or 1964. And is really cool. This is what you would use to record your voice, music, or anything onto reels that had wound tape. And the tape would run through the tape recorder part and then spool on the other side. So you would put your start, your finish, and off it would go. I might actually have that backwards. I, to be honest, I don't really know. Um, I've never used one of these before. Predates me by just a little bit here. So... Looking at it, we have rewind, stop, fast forward, playback, and record. So the buttons 
all feel like they work. The dials have the, uh, you can tell when they turn on. They feel smooth, they don't feel rusted inside. Same thing for the off and then the volume. Switch. There, we have a dial here. Looks like it, it actually turns. One, 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 two. This looks like it would be a timer as the music is playing. I bet that number clicks forward. Seven and a half for three fourths. You would set this depending on uh, your tape run, I'm assuming. So this thing is pretty cool. Um, let's pull this plastic off here. Old. This is, this is probably the original plastic. Um, I'm not even sure this thing was ever used, to be honest. It's in such good condition. Like it's literally like, it's just amazing looking how good and clean it is. Um, so I've got some wipes here. I'm just going to gently wipe this down and get it cleaned up a little bit here. And then we'll open it up and uh, see what the inside is looking like. So while these look in good condition, looks can be deceiving. Um, if you watched my Gibson uh, GA5 Skylark amplifier video, um, it looked to be in really good condition. But unfortunately, when I plugged it in, it does not work. Did not work. So looks can be deceiving because there's a lot that can go wrong in these devices, um, especially as they age. Super important um, to just keep them in good condition. Now, what happens is, you know, it's been this thing. Let's assume for hypothetical sake, for the purposes of discussion, that this tape recorder is 50 years old, right? So say it was built in 1963. It's now 2023. And I can almost guarantee you that the internals are worn. Capacitors are not going to hold a charge. Uh, that any of the resistors might be rusted out. You know, if there's glass tubes inside of this, which I'm going to bet there is, they may not work as well and might require replacing. As luck would have it, I thoroughly enjoy this kind of stuff. Um, I love everything about technology, electronics, video games, sound, music, movies. So this kind of stuff to me is just awesomely cool. And it's really fun to work with here. Um, so unfortunately, this particular device was sitting in a non-climate controlled environment. So it does have some what they call yellowing to it which is what you see with like this here. It's not the original color that it probably was. Um, might have been white or brighter and more vibrant at least. But the metal, the stainless steel, everything like that is clean. And that's really, you know, what matters here. Um, it looks to be though, I mean, overall, you, you can see I barely had to do anything to this and it's very clean for the most part here. Um, let's pop it up here just to show you. This is the speaker. You can actually see it uh, right here is where it would sound would come out. Let's go ahead here and wipe down the front just a little bit. Get some more water here. So you want to be careful, obviously, not to get any water or cleaning materials inside of the device. So I'm just going to go ahead and wipe down gently the front here. This thing looks to be in excellent condition. So one of the pluses of stuff like this, older stuff especially, I'm going to be very careful here to put it down, holding it not so it's not leaning on the tape recorder heads. You want to be very careful when you clean this kind of stuff. Obviously, you don't want to get water inside, like I've been saying. Um, one of the things I love about 1960s, 1970s electronics, they designed them to be basically portable all in its own self-contained you know, device. That's what you're seeing here. The device is the carrying case. The carrying case is the device, which was awesome. So there's no need for any of that additional you know, stuff there. Let's take a look at the cord. Super important when you look at the cord, you wanna make sure that your cord is not frayed or damaged or any way. If it is, replace it immediately because that could be a fire hazard. 
Got some stuff in here. Let's see if we can. This might be the old instruction. Ah, nope. Oh, wow. Look at this. This is the purchase receipt for this device. It looks like. Uh, this might have been a repair receipt. I'm not sure, actually. Purchase 3 8 It says REP Panasonic tape recorder paid twenty seven seventy five total. It would be $28.59. So I'm not actually sure if this is a repair bill or the device itself. I'm thinking this is actual for the actual device itself, which is pretty cool. Was purchased in Patterson, New Jersey, 240 Market Street. I'm venturing a guess to say, given where the uh, proximity to the area here. So that's pretty cool. I'm actually gonna put this aside and take a look at that later. Let's see, we got the side cover here open and close. That's nice. Oh, wait, what do we have here? Tag. T3300. I'm not actually sure what that means. Doesn't match up to the price. Might just be like an inventory control tag or something. Again, this predated like computers, stuff like that. So looking inside here, nothing else, a little dirty. Uh, we'll get a wipe here and just wipe this part out real quick. I love when you find this kind of stuff. It's, it's just really cool uh, to see how the old technology worked back in the, you know, 50 years ago now. Like I said, I mean, this thing had a receipt from 1969, but based on the little bit of research I did, I think this thing was built around 63 or 64, potentially, but even still, I mean, regardless of when it was built, built any time in the 60s, for all intents and purposes, it basically is a 50-year-old device. So let's see if we can open this up and see what's inside here. Now, I've got my trusty... Uh, Looks like I need a Phillips head screwdriver here, which I happen to have. I'm gonna take these screws off. Now, when you do anything like this, obviously, of course, don't ever leave these devices plugged in. If you did plug it in, very, very important. Let it sit for a while. Push some of the buttons on it so that the electricity discharges out of it. And I'll show you why that could be super important in a minute here. There's devices have capacitors in them, which have existed for a very long time. And capacitors are still used today and store and hold electrical charge to provide power to components inside of any electronic device. They've existed for a very long time. So you have to be super careful because if you power this device on and energize those capacitors, you could be in for a nice shock if you're not careful. So we'll take this cover off here. The cover actually popped off. It says a number inside, D1259. I feel like this device was serviced at some point. All right, I've got one, two, Ah, uh, looks like there's some more screws holding it down right here and right here. So let's go ahead here and top those screws out too. I think this screwdriver actually will fit that. It does. Now you don't want to be super careful not to force anything. Here we've got a washer, so we're going to, want to save those. Tape recorders were pretty cool back in the day. I mean, I remember when I was a kid having them that ah here we go 
I remember having a tape recorder when I was a kid to record. I used to record uh, CDs and stuff on the tape and record tape to tape. I Don't ask me why I recorded CDs to tape. I think I didn't have a CD player Walkman for like high school. And I used to record stuff on the tape to bring it to school with. And you could record fast forward. You could record it like fast forward where it sounded like the chipmunks were singing. And I could do tape to tape. Okay, so it looks like to get this cover off, I actually have to pop these dials off here. So we're going to pop these dials off. Put them to the side. They're both identical. So um, we don't have to worry about getting it. Now this cover should come off. Okay, it's connected here. So we're going to go ahead here and just lay it down like that. I'm not, I can't actually disconnect these because they are soldered on. So ooh, this thing is pretty dirty. Um, the heads, the rubber, you can see the rubber ropes here. Um, this interlock is provided to prevent dangerous electric shock. <laughs> yeah, so like I said, underneath this is where all the capacitors are, the tubes, and all of that stuff. So we have to be, you would have to be super careful not to touch anything underneath. I can see some stuff here. Let's see here. I see the transformer in the back. I can see the spins freely. This looks a little rotted out. I'm pretty sure this would not spin here. It actually looks like it's missing. Uh, uh, maybe not. But I can tell you that that is this is very flimsy and I don't see it uh, pulling unless it's supposed to do that, unless it pulls back when you plug it in, but uh, turn it on. But I don't see it um, actually doing anything here because it's so flimsy. I'm afraid to even touch it. This rubber one looks okay. Now, they do make replacement parts for these. Um, just checking how things work here. So when you tape recorders work, when you push the buttons, it physically manipulates mechanics inside. Modern stuff's all electronic. Fast forward is not no longer mechanical. This was all mechanical. So, ah, okay. There we go. You see here what I was saying? It, when I pushed play, it pushed this up to tighten this. Now this will turn. I know it's a little hard to see, but you can see it turning now. That's okay. That's the difference between old stuff and new stuff. I had no idea that that would actually do that. I should have known that, but I did not. So as you can see, when you push down, it releases pushing different buttons here, get it back to its normal all up position. Um, I mean, overall, this thing, other than like some like dirt and stuff, this actually looks pretty clean here. So I can, a lot of this is grease, believe it or not. It could be like this for a reason. They could have greased up these components. So I don't want to wipe down too much of this because, you know, I don't know what it could do doing that I could end up taking grease off something that's supposed to be there or inadvertently spreading grease around it looks like you have to oil it says oil here so you have to oil this kind of stuff that would be that would make sense I mean mechanical it moves so it needs oil lubricant you would now if it was me and I'm looking at this I think I understand now what this is this was a repair bill Repair to Panasonic tape recorder paid. He paid $27.75 to repair this. So probably what happened is as you use this device, it wears and tears. Now, the, the average person is not technically inclined enough to repair something like this. So you would take it to a place like Metro Television Parts, who metric television parts, who would take this device apart, oil it, lubricate it, check these bearings, check these, you know, rubber things here that turn the tape 
players, make sure everything is working order so that when you're out using it, you don't run into any issues. And you would do periodic maintenance. And I, I would venture a guess they would have service contracts similar to what they have today for mechanical equipment, uh, printers, Xerox machines, multifunction stuff, stuff like that, like that. You can get service contracts, repairs. You would need to do periodic repairs. Anything that moves, let's all be realistic, anything that moves is going to break. So you would have to keep up with the maintenance on it. It's not like it's electronic stuff like today where if your your old iPhone or if you had an old vintage iPod, it just breaks, you would just go out and buy a new one. That wasn't the case back then because something like this was very, very expensive. Newer stuff is what's called design to fail, where design to fail basically means in a nutshell, the equipment that's inside is made and organized in such a way that it's basically done as cheaply as possible. And the equipment fails, they want it to fail because then you'll go out and buy a new one versus repairing it. A prime example of that, and as much as I love video games and everything like that, the Nintendo Switch. If you look at the Nintendo Switch, it is designed to fail. It is a great piece of electronics and an awesome gaming system, but it's made so poorly. The Joy-Cons, which are the controllers on the side, are notoriously failures. Rate is so high. They get what's called Joy-Con drift, where you'll be sitting there and you not touch it and you're your person, your view will just move on its own. It'll jitter, it'll move. That's because the internal components are nothing but cheap metals and cheap plastic and literally fail. So you either have to replace it, the Joy-Cons, which at the expense of $80 for a set of Joy-Cons, send it back to Nintendo for repair, which then means you have to wait. And if you don't have any more Joy-Cons, then you're stuck not being able to essentially play it if you don't have a pro controller or anything like that, Nintendo really needs to fix that design. And hopefully in the future models, they do. But we'll see because one would hope with all the negative feedback and press that Nintendo has gotten because of that issue, they won't make that same mistake again. But that's a prime example of what's called design to fail. They're made as cheaply as possible where they can keep the costs higher and make more margins versus using more expensive equipment. So it's a, it's a common thing. But again, like I said, I mean, this looks pretty good here. The springs all look good. This feels okay. I'm surprised that this is paper. It's some sort of paper, rubberish thing. Um, I'm half tempted to plug this thing in and see if it works before I even do anything else. Because it looks like it's in good working order. There's no rust. There's no real mechanical defects or anything like that. Um, it looks to be overall in good condition. Now, whether or not, you know, if there are fuses underneath here, if it's transformers are blown, who knows? I mean, this is a 50-year-old thing. Who knows how long this was sitting in a garage for? But, I mean, let's plug it in and find out. So, a couple of recommendations here when you plug something this old in, always look at the cords. Make sure that the cord is not frayed or damaged in any way because you could get an electrical shock, could be a fire hazard. I would recommend plugging this device in to a circuit in your house that doesn't have anything super important on it um, in case there's any kind of feedbacks or anything like that. But let's see what happens when we plug this thing in here. So we'll go ahead and put these uh, knobs back on here. Just to hold this cover down. I may end up taking the cover off to see. Okay, I gotta pull that back up. Gotta remember when you put knobs back on, they gotta start in the position that is off. So there we go. All right, let's see what happens. Yeah, it doesn't work. I was hoping it would have at least turned on, but 
I'm actually not surprised that it hasn't. Again, this is a 50 year old device. So we'll probably have to get out a voltmeter and do some troubleshooting to see why this particular device does not want to work. I don't smell anything burning. Which is good, but I also don't hear anything. Usually with these devices, you can hear something. So why do you hear things? Transformers, the power supply that's in it. Again, this is old stuff. They would hum. They would make noise. The mechanical stuff, such as the glass tubes, if there are any underneath here, which there probably are in this, um, would make noise. So again, this thing is, like I said, super old. So would require some components to fix it. So I'm gonna to have to do that and see what's going on here to make this thing work. Now, I did a little research online. These things are not really worth anything. Um, maybe 50 bucks, 100 bucks at that. They were just, were not, they didn't hold their value like other things did. So there's no real resale value in this. It's more just do I wanna do it for fun. But this is a really awesome appliance. Like I said, you would put your tapes and by tapes, I mean rolls of tape on here and here. They came in a plastic cassette. I wish I had some to show you. You would then run the wire through. Um, where's this going like that? It goes like that. You would run your wire through here and it would play loop back here. So you would then start recording. And as this turned and this turned, one would turn. That's what it is. One would turn. And as it turns, it would pull the tape to this side. So I'm going to go and venture. I guess you would put your full one on here. Put your empty one on this side. It would then play. You would press play. I wish it turned. Um, you would push play. It would pull the tape through and record everything it hears. You would plug your microphone, radio, or external speaker to hear what you were recording on here. And it would record what it hears onto this. So the audio would be recorded as magnetic through magnetic transfers and stuff like that onto your tape. Then you would then take this off and that tape would be your recording. It would be a big, it wasn't cassette tapes like you're thinking. This thing took big, like, I don't even know what you call them, just cassettes that were on here. And you, when you wanted to play it back, you would do the same thing. You would spool it on this side, tell it to play back. It would pull the tape through and then spool back on this side. So when you were done, you had to play the whole thing. When it was done, you would have it on this side and take this one off and keep this one empty. So you would rotate them around. And you could, over, you could overwrite existing ones because it would just basically redo the magnetic structure of that tape the considerations about magnetic stuff is it doesn't last forever. So that's why that technology, you know, is long gone now anyway, but there are still recordings of old tape playback. And that's why you hear that static hissing and all that stuff because they degrade over time or not recorded properly. But regardless of that, this doesn't work. This thing is really cool. And it's a really old piece of technology that I thought I would share with you. And I got it for, like I said, I got it for $5 or $10. So no real loss out of my pocket here. I'll evaluate whether or not this works. I can make it work. And if it's worth it to make it work for either the sentimental to keep or the resale value, or if anybody's just interested. Um, if anybody would like to see a detailed repair video of me taking this all apart and making it work, please definitely drop a comment on this video and I will make that happen depending on how many people are interested. Um, as always, if you could click that like button, subscribe to the channel and make sure you enable notifications. That would be totally awesome. And again, this is the Panasonic sound monitoring system, the RQ705, circa 1960s. So I think this thing is really awesome and I had a lot of fun taking it apart. So I will see everyone around. Thanks a lot for watching. Have a great day and keep on gaming.